be in amazing places like Singapore, which I love. In fact, I love it so much, I'm coming back next month to celebrate my birthday here because it's such an amazing place to be. But I also get the opportunity to write books, and I, I, I love writing. I've always loved writing ever since I can remember. I love reading books, and I love writing, and, and I love telling stories and imagining imaginary worlds and strange dimensions and unknown places and people. And, and usually when you, when you write a book, you don't tell people how the book came to you, but, but my newest book is called The Way of the Warrior, and it came to me in the most unusual way. My, my wife, Kim, and I were driving through Hollywood, where we live, and we were driving down Vine, and, and we were both really quiet. we have been married 35 years, so we have moments where we don't say anything anymore to each other. We, we've talked so much, and, and, and in that moment of silence, I heard this voice in my head. I, I know that doesn't sound sane, but I have a lot of voices in my head and some of them are interesting. And so I, I heard this voice in my head and the voice said this, the warrior is not ready for battle until they've come to know peace. This is the way of the warrior. I, I, I had no expectation to hear that message. I had no idea where it came from, but the moment I heard it, I leaned over to my wife and I said, I know what my next book is and I know what the first sentence is. It's called The Way of the Warrior and in the opening declaration is the warrior is not ready for battle until they've come to know peace. And as I started looking back, thinking, how did that happen in that moment? And what I've discovered in life is that moments of creativity, moments of inspiration are those moments where all these other experiences and seemingly disconnected moments collide in one moment and give you a burst of insight. And I, I love Asian films. One of my favorite movies of all time is The Seventh Samurai. I love Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. I watched Hero at least five times. I've even gone to see bad Chinese films. I even like The Last Samurai because Ken Watanabe was amazing. And as I look back, I realized when I heard that voice, it was probably Ken Watanabe's voice. <laughs> and I heard it as if it was an ancient samurai talking to a younger samurai. But there was a bigger reason that was happening. I, I live in LA and our church mosaic is full of thousands of 20 year olds. And one of the interesting things about LA is that LA is a magnet of the most beautiful people in the world coming to LA. Sometimes when I'm in LA, I forget the rest of the world doesn't look like this all the time. Because I feel so incredibly ugly in LA. It's like I don't belong there. I feel like I'm an alien. Because every time you look around, there's another actress, and another actress, and another model, and another model, and another model, and another model. And, and the boyfriend, who's just as pretty as the girlfriend. And, <laughs> and you have a city where the most talented, gifted, creative, attractive people in the world come together, and they're all pursuing the same dream. They're all going to be the next Tom Hardy. They're all going to be the next Scarlett Johansson. And they're all competing and fighting for the exact same dream, but only one person gets the dream in 10,000. Watch their dreams fall apart. And so in this city where everyone looks so good, if you take just a little bit of time, you realize it's a city that's so broken. It looks so good on the outside. It's so hollow and empty on the inside. And over the 30 years that I've lived in L.A., I've seen so many of my friends who were so gifted and so talented come to the end of their own lives. And then I looked at my own life. I, I am an overachiever in depression and neurosis and psychosis. I was 12 years old when I was in a psychiatric chair. I, I spent months in and out of a hospital for what they called psychosomatic illnesses. In fact, I remember I, 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 I was 10 or 11 years old. I got up late one night to get some water, and I heard my mom and stepdad talking, and they were talking about me. And they were saying that they needed to send me to a psychiatrist. And I overheard them. We don't know what to do. We don't know what to do. We don't know what to do with him. We don't know how to help him. We need to send him to a psychiatrist. He needs professional help. 
I was just barely 10 and I'm hearing I need professional help. So I said, hey, wh what are you talking about? And they were shocked when they saw me. They said, no, nothing, honey. And I said, no, it sounds like you're saying I need to go to a psychiatrist. They go, well, we just thought maybe you could get some help. And I remember I started screaming, I'm not crazy. I'm not crazy. I'm not crazy. I'm not crazy. And then I had a moment of self-awareness where I realized I look really crazy right now. And so I stopped and they're like, you don't have to go, you don't have to go, you don't have to go. And, I, and I stopped and I said, no, no, no. I want to go. Because if I'm crazy, I, I want to know. But that's the problem. If you're actually crazy, do you ever really know? See, I, I don't know if I'm crazy, but I've come to learn that crazy works. And what I want to take just a few minutes and talk to you about is how to win the battle for your inner world. Because one of the great challenges I found in my own life is that when you come to faith and you become a follower of Jesus and you put your trust in God, everybody acts as if everything's supposed to be okay then. It's all supposed to work now, but what do you do when you love God with every fiber of your being but you're still struggling with depression? See, well, what do you do when you're, you're, you're gathering all the faith you can, but you're still stressed out? Well, what do you do when, when you're trying to base your identity in Christ the way everyone tells you to, but you still feel insignificant and you still don't know if you matter? What, what do you do when you, you've taken a hold of all the faith you know, have done everything everybody told you to do, but you don't know how to explain that your inner world is in turmoil, that you're falling apart, that, that something inside of you feels broken, and, and you don't want to tell anyone because when you've tried to tell someone, they just go, oh, just pray about it. You're going to be fine. And I want you to know that the most important battle you will ever fight is the one for your soul. And that there's an inner peace that, that God wants to give you, but it doesn't come without a fight. You ever, you ever hear someone say, oh, I want to I live a life like David? Or I, wanna, I want a life like Joshua? Or I want to live a life like Esther? You, you know, whenever, whenever someone admires someone in the Bible and, wants, and says, I want to be like David, I want to live a life like them, I know they've never read the Bible. Because <laughs> if you read the Bible, like, I don't, I don't really want David's life, okay? <laughs> like, I don't want Esther's life, I don't want, I don't want Moses' life. You really want to be 80 years old when you finally get it. <laughs> See, I think the problem a lot of times is that we keep comparing their highlights with our real life. And then we think there's something broken with us. We don't realize that that brokenness is just the expression of our humanity. There's some of you here, you need to step into the freedom of authenticity. You need to find that, that grace and that space where you can be honest about where you are and who you are and know that as broken and messed up as you may be, you are in perfect condition for God to do something amazing with your life. So I want to talk to you a little bit about a guy named Elijah because I think Elijah is kind of epic. I mean, Elijah existed before the X-Men. Like, Elijah was around before the Avengers. I mean, Elijah is like a superhero. He, he runs faster than a chariot. He calls fire down from heaven. He talks to the clouds and it stops raining for three and a half years. He's epic. He is all the X-Men wrapped up in one Jewish guy. And he has this moment, he has a highlight moment. You know it. If you know anything about the Bible, you know this moment where, where he goes up against almost a thousand false prophets and, and, he, and, he's, and he realizes all the people are following the, the false gods. So he says, all right, you build an altar and I'll build an altar. We'll pray, you pray to your gods or pray to my God, whose ever God is real. 
will bring fire down from heaven. Whoever brings fire down from heaven, that's who everybody's going to worship. Everybody says, great idea. So they, they go and they pray and they, they build their altar. They cry out to their God. They're praying all day long, but nothing happens because it's really hard to get the attention of a God that does not exist. And so they're crying out to the God. And Elijah, he's sort of cynical. He's like a jaded Jewish comedian. He's like, maybe your gods can't hear you. You should pray louder. And at one point, and they translate it kind of soft because they don't want to embarrass anyone, but it actually says, maybe your gods are indisposed because they're constipated. <laughs> it's really bad when you catch your God in an awkward moment and he can't come out and help you. And so maybe you should just give him a moment. And, and, and so all those prophets started cutting themselves and crying out to the gods because that was their, their tradition. It was the darkness of their religion. And then, of course, when it was Elijah's turn, after they'd bled themselves virtually to death, Elijah, he has to, like, just totally hand this thing up. He can't just build an altar. He has to flood it. Just flood it with some water. No, do it again, do it again, do it again. He's, he's showing off. Seven times, just pours water on it. And then his prayer is really simple, okay? You got this. My translation. And <laughs> calls the fire from heaven. The fire comes, consumes the altar, the other altar, and a few people. Details. Now, you would think that after a moment like that, you would never struggle with faith again, right? Have you ever had that moment where you thought to yourself, God, I just need, like, one miracle? I've had that thought. God, if I could just have one miracle, I'll never doubt you again. If I could just, I mean, if I could just have one moment where I could pray and fire would come down from heaven, I would never need God to answer any other prayer. I, I'd be good. For the rest of my life. But I don't want that to happen when no one's watching. I mean, I need, I need, I need an audience. Because if, if I'm going to have a fire from heaven moment, I want everyone who doesn't believe in me there. Don't you? Come on. I want people to go, yeah, that's him. He's the fire caller. I, I want everyone to know, don't mess with me. I can call fire. <laughs> if you have a moment like that, you should never doubt God again. See, I, I think the problem is that most of us think what our faith is missing is something spectacular. We're looking for a miracle, for some phenomenon to prove to us that God is real. But I want you to know that even if fire fell down from heaven, you would still struggle with doubt and with fear, with insignificance, maybe even with despair. Because the very next chapter in 1 Kings 19, it tells us this, beginning in verse 1. This is right after calling fire down. Now Ahab told Jezebel, Ahab and Jezebel are the king and the queen, and you know that they're evil just by the name Jezebel. You know she's evil. <laughs> you know how you know that? Okay, anybody here whose name is Jezebel? <laughs> now, anybody here planning to name their daughter Jezebel? See, that's how you know. She's evil because no one names their kid Jezebel. <laughs> now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, may the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like one of them. So Jezebel sends a threat through a messenger to Elijah saying, I'm going to kill you. If I'm Elijah, I'm like, bring it on, woman. Come this way. But we're going to be having a barbecue. Because I, I call fire down from heaven. I just wiped out a thousand men. You think I'm going to be afraid of one woman? Yes. Because instead of standing in his faith, instead of standing with courage, Instead of standing in the confidence that we would assume would be there when you're calling fire down from heaven, it says that when Elijah heard this, verse 3, Elijah was afraid 
and ran for his life. How does that happen? You ever read the Bible and think to yourself, that's not what's supposed to happen? How in the world could Elijah, who has the power to call fire down from heaven, now run in fear just because he's been threatened? And one of the things I can know for certain is that success does not make you immune from feeling like a failure. I want you to listen to me. Some of you think what you need is God to do something big in your life. What you need is for God to perform some kind of miracle. What you need is some kind of proof that God is present in your life and then you're gonna be fine. But I want you to realize that all the success in the world will never take away the hollowness inside of your soul, the battle within you, because the same battle that Elijah had within him is within us. And the battle for peace is not a peace you fight one time, it's a battle you have to fight every single day of your life. So he runs for his life. Be careful when you're running for your life that you're not running from your life. It says when he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. And he came to a broom bush, tr bush and he sat down under it, and he prayed that he might die. He prayed that he might die. When I go back home to L.A., I have to uh, go do a funeral for a 17-year-old DJ who couldn't find one more reason to live one more day. I had to hold his parents as they wept. And ironically, they were at church thanking us for giving their son the only hope for helping him find Jesus in his struggle. But in one moment, on one day, the darkness that was consuming him felt too strong, too much, and it consumed him. And we never talk about this, but there are people in the Bible who are contemplating suicide. And they're some of the most important, heroic, beautiful people in the scriptures. Elijah prayed, God, kill me. And I have a sense, even in this place, you're the most talented, intelligent, gifted people in the world. I mean, I don't know if you even know the reputation of Singapore. But the world looks at you with so much awe and respect. You are ambitious and driven and gifted and intelligent. And you will be some of the most influential people in the world, not just in your country. But there's some of you right now, you feel the weight of your life so heavy. You're 14 years old, you're 16 years old, you're 15 years old, and you're suffocating because you feel like the pressure to achieve is more than you can bear. And maybe I'm wrong, but I, I see this in L.A. All of this talent crushes you when it becomes the basis of your identity. Some of you are praying the same prayer, God, just end me. Can you imagine Elijah being so filled with despair that says, God, I just want to die. By the way, that's not a very creative prayer. I'm just saying, I'm not trying to be hard-hearted. I'm just saying Elijah was known for his creativity in prayer. I mean, who prays? I don't think it should rain for three and a half years. That's a pretty creative prayer. Stop raining. And then three and a half years later, okay, you can rain now. I can almost feel like the whole, the whole oh, the heavens like, now, no, no, no. Now, no, you can just feel the clouds holding the rain, waiting for the day when Elijah says, now. Nah. That's creative praying. I mean, who thinks about, let's build altars and let's call fire out of heaven. That never been done before. By the way, never been done since. So it's pretty creative. I mean, where does that come from? 
that kind of imagination. I think fire coming from heaven, consuming altars, that would be, that would be decisive. It'd be kind of epic. I think this is the way the story should go. And that's pretty creative. He couldn't think of a more creative prayer than God kill me. I mean, how about like God kill Jezebel? I don't know. I'm just thinking, you know. Okay, I know you're not supposed to pray that. So I'm just saying it's a little more creative, right? Or, or, or God send my wife to take care of Jezebel, you know, and mano a mano, right? Just, you know, it's, or, or maybe he could pray, God, you hold the heart of kings in your hands. Couldn't you change the heart of Jezebel and turn her heart towards you? I mean, any other prayer would have been more creative than God kill me. See, God kill me says, God, I don't see any way you could do anything to make my future better. God, kill me. He said, I've had enough. I've had enough, Lord. He said, take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. I had moments in my life where I thought the best option would be not to live. I've had moments in my life I felt so suffocated by life, so overwhelmed by my failures, so overwhelmed by my sense of insignificance, and I felt as if I were drowning in the emptiness of my soul. I've had times in my life where it took all the strength and all the courage I had just to get up out of bed and live one more day. Because there's nothing more exhausting than just existing. There's some of you, you're spending all your energy just existing. But I, I, I don't know, I don't think his prayer was sincere. I don't think he wanted to die. Here's why. All right. Elijah's over here. He gets this message. Jezebel says, I'm going to kill you. So he runs for his life. He goes out into the desert in the middle of nowhere, and he says to God, God, kill me. See, if I were God, I'd go, I already took care of that. Just go back, <laughs> and she's going to kill you. She's going to answer your prayer. <laughs> See, that's how I sense his prayer was insincere. Because he's asking God to do what she already wanted to do. Now, you see, actually what he was saying is, God, I feel powerless to fix this. So I, I just want you to end my life because I can't see a way through this. Have you ever just run from your problems? Have you ever run from the battle that God actually has in front of you? Run from the challenge that God wants you to take on? Let me tell you what I've discovered in my life. Everything I run from, eventually God is going to make me run to. It's always going to come back around. And so if you're afraid of a battle right now, you might as well just step into it because that battle is going to come back. Because God will not allow you to define yourself as a coward. God will not allow you to convince yourself that there is any giant you cannot bring down. Instead of saying, God, kill me, he should have said, God, let me die a good death. We're all going to die. Just a matter of how we face that death. Two and a half years ago, I was told when we walked into this doctor's office that I had cancer. And they told me that it was late stages cancer, stage four, stage five. Within three weeks, I had to have six hours of surgery. I didn't know if I was going to live or die. And one of the things that really struck me as so curious in the journey is it was really devastating for my wife and my kids. But I, I can tell you in this moment that I never felt afraid. And I even thought, what's wrong with me? I should be afraid. And I began to realize that, that years and years before, I had dealt with death. I, I was in the highest crime rate, murder rate area in the United States. And, and I was driving my, my wife's little car through the ghetto. And I was afraid to get out of the car because it looked so violent all around. And I remember driving really fast, 
and I just stopped the car in the middle of a giant street, and I started praying. I said, God, how am I supposed to do something here when I'm afraid to get out of the car? I was only like 24 years old. And I, I was waiting for a Bible verse that I'd memorized to, to come and inspire me, like, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world, or fear not, for I am with you, says the Lord, or I can do all things through Christ who strengthen me. All these great verses that we want to memorize. But the verse that came crashing into my head was a verse I never meant to memorize. The verse I heard so clearly was, to live is Christ and to die is gain. That was not encouraging. I was like, that's not really helpful, God. But it was so clear in that moment, God was saying to me, Irwin, if you'll just die right now, I will take you where only dead men can go. And it ended a conversation for me. See, I, I think the problem is that most of us are not afraid of death. We're afraid of life. We're not afraid of dying. We're afraid of living. Because the greatest act of courage in your life will be to live each day for the calling and the destiny that God created you to live. Elijah should not have said, God, kill me. He should have said, God, do you want me to go and die for this moment, for this cause? Is that why I'm here? And then it says he went under a bush and he prayed that he might die. And then you know what he did? He went to sleep. I love that. <laughs> then he laid down under the bush and fell asleep. What do you do when you're stressed out? Come on. You sleep, right? I mean, we do a lot of things. Some people, when you're stressed, how many of you sleep? Wow. H how many, when you're depressed, can't sleep? How many is like both? I, I sleep and can't sleep at the same time. All right. How many of you, when you're stressed out, eat? Wow. A lot of you sleeping and eating a lot, OK? How many of you, when you're stressed out, can't eat? Okay, yeah, I'm like both of those too. In fact, when I'm stressed out, I don't eat and I eat. And when, when the book came out, I got, I got all stressed out. You, you ever had like a panic attack? Am I allowed to talk about these things? Because your speaker gets stressed out and has panic attacks and, um, and sometimes feels overwhelmed by life. Because this is real life. Because we don't need people anymore telling us that when you come to Jesus, you never struggle with this stuff. You need people telling us the truth. So the book comes out, I'm in New York, and I'm having like, I'm having like this a panic attack. I call my wife, I'm, so, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm so anxious, I'm stressed out, I don't know what's going on. She goes, what's wrong? I, said, I don't know what's wrong. She says, what's stressing me out? I don't know what's stressing me out. That's what stress is. <laughs> it's not logical. I can't identify the source. Everything is stressing me out. You know what's stressing me out? I wrote a book about inner peace and I don't have any right now. That's what's stressing me out. <laughs> so I flew home to LA, I said to my wife, Kim, let's go get pizza. She goes, what? Because I try to eat healthy. And I said, yeah, let's go get pizza. So we went to this little pizza place around the corner. I ordered the largest pizza they had. And my wife said, are other people joining us? I said, don't judge me. <laughs> and then, then she had her slice. And then I ate the rest of that pizza. And <laughs> she goes, you're stressed out. Right? I'm stress eating. I'm stress, it's, I'm stress pizza. -ing. And, uh, and then after we left the pizza place, I said, hey, hon, do you want to go, go get ice cream? She goes, you want to get ice cream? I go, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're next door, we'll get ice cream. And then I saw in my mind, it was like a vision, a pink box. Because in the States, donuts always come in pink boxes. <laughs> and, uh... But you know, when I was a kid, because I was an immigrant from El Salvador, and I never knew my real father, and I didn't really know my mom in 
the earliest years of my life, well, and then my mom remarries a guy in what we called creative underground economies. <laughs> You'll figure that out later. <laughs> and, uh, and he has a different name, but they tell me he's my real dad, but I don't remember him. And then he takes us to a police station and convinces the police we've been robbed and that we don't have any identification. And I walked out Erwin McManus. Now, I don't know if you can tell, I'm not Irish. <laughs> and I'm not German, I'm Spanish. And so I went from Rafael Cardona, Mesa Sandoval, you know, and uh, <laughs> to Erwin McManus. And the world just didn't make any sense to me. I had nightmares every day for like five years. And I had night terrors that would wake me up in the middle of the night and I would be wide awake and the terrors would still be there. And I would sleepwalk and they would find me in the streets, in El Salvador, wandering the streets. And in my dreams, I was trying to find my way home, but I couldn't find where home was. And I wish I could tell you I only had those when I was 10. But it wasn't 10 years ago when I would travel the world, I'd sleep with my hotel room open because my night terrors were so severe that they were life-threatening because the battle in my inner world was so intense that I couldn't figure out how to win it. And it was strange because I could feel I was becoming whole, but there was a part of me that still was broken. Can anybody identify with that? And I had a hard time getting out of bed in the morning and then I couldn't go to sleep at night. And I went for years without sleeping more than a few hours a night. And I think it's interesting that he fell asleep. And I think he fell asleep because real life was just too much of a burden for him. So he wanted to hide in a world he created in his unconscious. I was a, a straight D student, first through 12th grade. I had a balanced education. I don't think I ever accidentally made an A or a B, or a C. And when I remember when I was in fifth, sixth, seventh grade, I, I would go to school and every year I'd tell myself, this year I'm, I'm gonna make A's, this year I'm gonna achieve, this year I'm gonna excel. Because you see, when I went to that psychiatrist, they were trying to see if I was what they called retarded. Because <laughs> they weren't sure if I was just broken mentally. And I, I, I would wake up in class, having been in this imaginary world, and all the class would be gone. The teacher would be gone, the students would be gone. I, I would disappear in my inner world and they couldn't get my attention and they, they couldn't get me back. I could feel myself creating this inner world where I would just hide because I felt safer in this world than it did in the real world. And I know this sounds crazy, but, well, because it is. But uh, I, I, I convinced myself that I was from another planet. I, I convinced myself that I was an alien species and that they had dropped me here on Earth to see if we could merge with humans. <laughs> and I would run away to fields at night and I would scream into the sky and to the stars, please come back and get me. I don't belong here. I don't belong here. You know what's more terrifying than thinking you're an alien from another planet that doesn't belong with the species? Is to discover you're from this planet and you don't belong with the species. And I didn't know that my deep sense of aloneness was something that all of us feel. Elijah fell asleep because he did not want to be awake. And some of you are sleepwalking through your life and you need to begin to living out your dreams. And then look what God does. I love this about God. And I want you to see that with Elijah, you realize that your success will not make you immune from feeling like a failure. And those high moments in life, they can happen at the same time as the low moments in life. Because you're human. He says, he fell asleep and at once an angel touched him. <laughs> if I were God, I wouldn't just touch him. I'm just like, slap him. <laughs> Get your butt up. Am I allowed to say that here? You know? 
I would say, Elijah, get your hipster butt off the ground. Get up, you ungrateful prophet. Right? Isn't that what we do as parents? Isn't that, we try, isn't that what we try to teach, teach spiritual discipline? You know what God does? He gently touches him and he feeds him. He says, get up and eat. He looked around and there by his head was some baked bread over hot coals and a jar of water. God cooked for Elijah and took time to heal his body because he knows that when you're emotionally sick, you become physically sick. When you're spiritually unhealthy, you become emotionally unhealthy and relationally unhealthy and physically unhealthy. And God begins by giving him some food and saying, take care of your body, Elijah. Get yourself some strength. And it says that God baked him some hot bread. I love that. Now, stay with me. Hot coals, baked bread, a little marinara sauce, a little cheese, pizza. And it doesn't just happen once. He looked around, there was baked bread over hot coals and a jar of water, and he ate and he drank and he laid down and went back to sleep again. It's like, thanks God, I'm out. <laughs> the angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, get up and eat. Because after dinner, you have to have dessert. Baked bread, little cinnamon, little dark chocolate, Little hole in the middle. <laughs> Donuts, right? Uh -huh. Don't let anyone tell you that God does not use carbs to bring you back. <laughs> and a jar of water, sparkling. And he ate and he drank. And God says, get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. I love that God tells him the truth. Wouldn't it be better if he said, don't worry, Elijah, it's not going to be as hard as you think. Don't worry, you're, you're over the hard part. You're over the hard part. God doesn't tell him that. He says, Elijah, eat, because the journey is too much for you. So now I want you to hear this. Maybe you've faced some hard times. Maybe you've had some real struggles in your life. Maybe you've had some battles, some challenges, some disappointments, some failures. And it's not going to get easier. People keep asking me, when does it get easier? And I have to tell you the truth. It never gets easier. You get stronger. I'm so glad, he says, because the journey is too much for you. Why would God ever call you to a journey that's too small for you? He's not going to call you to a journey that's less than you. He's going to call you to a journey that's bigger than you, to a challenge that's bigger than you, to a life that's bigger than you, to a vision that's bigger than you, because you have a God that is bigger than you. It has to be bigger than you so there's room for him. I think it was like 20 years ago I had a friend who was a writer for a TV show called Dexter and Jessica Jones. And he came up to me and said, hey, I have a, a pilot idea for a TV show. And I think you're perfect for the part because I wrote it with you in mind. And I said, that's awesome. So what is it? He goes, it, it's, a, it's an assassin. I said, okay, okay, and, uh, and he's a sociopath. I said, okay, 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 and, and, you, and somehow I, I, I inspired that, okay, and, and, and so he convinced me to take on this part, and, and I had to do all this training to be an assassin. It was, it was so cool. Like, I, I, it was my cool moment in life. I mean, you know, I couldn't hold it, but it was cool for a moment, and, and I had one friend that taught me how to use real weapons, and I was like, first time, gun range, 
five out of six bullseyes. I was a natural killer <laughs> of targets, targets. <laughs> and then I had another friend who worked on other movies, and he was a stuntman, and he worked like on Indiana Jones, and, and, and so he taught me how to do stunts. So we were learning how to jump out of buildings, how to fall where I don't kill myself. And I was doing all of this, and it was exhausting. And then, and then we got this director who had won this Academy Award for a foreign short film. And it was just like a perfect convergence of things. And everything was exactly right except for me. And, but I didn't care. It was still fun. And, and one of the scenes, this giant guy, he's like, I don't know, 6'5", 6'6", 300 pounds. Him and I were in a fight. And he had to beat me up, which was not acting. And... And I, he literally picked me up and just threw me into a wall and dented the wall with my body. It was so much fun. <laughs> and, and then we had the epic scene where I had to, he, he throws me out of a skyscraper window. And, and I said, okay, how does that work? And I said, it's going to be like one of those uh, fake windows, like, you know, shatter, break, breakaway windows. They said, can't be one of those because it won't look authentic. It has to be a real skyscraper window. <laughs> and you have to fly through it. And, and it'll look like he's throwing you, but you actually will be jumping, lunging at the window, and it'll break when your head hits the window. And, and I, I said, so if I throw myself into the force, the window will break? And said, no. I said, then how will it break? I said, well, we have to set four explosives on each corner of the window, and then our demolition expert will time the explosion so the moment that your head hits that window, he'll designate it, the explosion will create a burst, and you'll go flying through the window as the glass breaks all around you. I said, okay. And, and, and he said, a couple notes, close your eyes, because you could go blind. Close your mouth, you don't want to swallow glass. <laughs> so we did a practice runs, but they had three, I think, plate glass windows. I said, why do we have three? And they said, in case we need other takes. And I said, we won't need other takes. We, we're going we're gonna to get this right on the first take, I know. And, and, and I said, put a camera underneath me so it can catch me flying through. And they said, well, you have to be able to clear that camera. I said, oh, I'll clear that camera. And then right before I have to shoot the scene, the demolition expert put the explosives in his corner, and I'm on this elevated piece, and I'm getting ready to jump. And then they go, clear the set! I go, well, what are you doing? He said, we're, we're clearing the set. I said, why? And he said, it's too dangerous for people to be on set. Yeah, like, but they're like way over there. Like, I'm like right here. I, how can you need to clear that part of the set if you're not clearing like this part of the set? And, and I said, you know, do you, we can use the stunt double. And I said, no, I have to do this. And they cleared the set. My heart was pounding against my chest. And they're like, okay, on the count of three. I go, okay, wait a moment. Is it like... One, two, three? Or is it one, two, three? I said, just three. Just jump on three. So the set was clear. They covered the cameramen with blankets. I was the only person uncovered. And I heard, three, two, one. And I remember jumping, hitting the glass, and then I heard, and when the glass exploded through those four pieces of explosives, I went flying through the glass. It's as if that explosion elevated me through. And it became so clear to me. There was a part of this that I had to do. I had to choose to jump. I had to choose to move toward a barrier I knew I did not have the strength or power to break. And then I had to trust that the outside forces that were in place would do the work I could not do to take me where I could not go alone. 
I want you to know. I think you see it. There is a life God is calling you into. There is a future that God has planned for you. There is a tomorrow that's waiting for you. The moment you go, God, I just want it to end right now. You need to hear God say to you, you got to trust me. I cannot jump for you. So if you just stay paralyzed where you are, you're going to blame me the rest of your life for never giving you the life I promised to give you. Because there are some things that God will not do for you that you must do so that God can position you to do what he wants to do. And if you'll just take that leap into your future, God will set off his explosives and break every barrier that keeps you from your tomorrow. God said, get up. Because the journey is too much for you. And I want you to know that the most important battle you will ever fight is the battle for your own soul. And the warrior is not ready for battle until they've come to know peace. See, that's the problem is that this peace that you long for, no one can get there but you. No one can help you but you. Oh, except for the one who created you. See, that's why when you give your life to Jesus, the battle changes in an instant. Because the battle for your inner world is fought alone until you open up your soul to Jesus. Then Jesus comes into the universe of you, and he becomes the warrior who fights the battle for your peace. And he will never condemn you. He will never condemn you for your doubt or your fear. He will not condemn you for your feelings of insignificance. He will not condemn you when you feel depressed or despaired. He'll just take care of you and strengthen you and get you ready because your story isn't over yet. There's some of you here right now. You're 15 years old and you feel too tired to dream about your future. And I want you to know that there's a God who sees you and knows you and loves you. And he's not discouraged with the battle going on inside of you. He's not afraid of your questions. He's not afraid of your doubts. He's not afraid of your your failures or your, your, your sins or your shortcomings or your brokenness. I love the fact that God chose to use me in all of my brokenness, in all of my inadequacy, with all my sense of insignificance and inadequacy. I think that God loves proving the world wrong when people look at you and think you're not enough. God wants you to know you were never supposed to be enough. He was supposed to be enough. And so I want you to bow your heads with me just for a moment right now. There's some of you here right now. And you've had voices in your own head telling you, you're never going to amount to anything. You're never going to be happy. You're never going to be free. You're never going to be loved. You're never going to be enough. There's some of you, you have a voices in your head telling you, why don't you just end it? And tonight I want to bring an end to those voices. I want to silence the voices that tell you you are less. And I want you to hear the voice of God that calls you to more. And if you're here and you've been struggling with depression, maybe you feel like you're just overwhelmed with despair. Maybe you're here and you just so full of anxiety or stress and and you can't even figure out how you got here. But you're just tired of hiding that. You're spending all your energy hiding the battle so you don't have any energy to win the battle. And if you're in this battle right now and your inner world is just in turmoil and it's in chaos 
and you're in pain, but you want to be free tonight, I want you to just stand right now. I just want you to stand and be free of any shame. You don't need to hide. You don't need to pretend right now. I just want you to stand if that's you. Saying, Jesus, I just need to be free. I just need to be free. I need you to give me peace. I'm just so tired of fighting this battle alone, Jesus. I just can't do this alone anymore. I don't want to do this one more day in my own strength. Anyone else right now, just stand all over the room. Just stand right now. There's a freedom that Jesus wants to bring to you right now. There's a peace he wants to bring to you right now. There's a healing he wants to bring to your life right now. Anyone else, just stand. You don't have to explain it. You don't have to explain it to anybody else. This is just between you and God right now. If that's you, just stand. I know there's still some of you, you're struggling right now. You're afraid to stand. You don't want people to know that you're struggling. But who cares? People here are going to support you. They're going to fight the battle with you. And I want you to know, if you don't feel you have the strength to fight for yourself, there's a room full of people here who are going to fight for you right now. And if you need people to fight for you, I want you to stand right now. If you need people to pray for you, I want you to stand right now. If this is your moment to find freedom and peace, you stand all over the room, one by one. Stand. Father, I pray for all the, the beautiful people who in this moment have stood and said, I, I've got some battles inside of me that I need to win. I need freedom. God, whether it's fear or stress or anxiety or depression or insignificance, God, whether it's a fear of failure or the fear of the future or the fear of rejection or maybe they just feel like they, they're afraid of letting down their parents, they feel like they can't live up to the expectations of others. God, I pray right now you would just set them free, Lord God. I pray that you would just release them and bring healing into their soul right now, Lord Jesus. I pray that that freedom would be unleashed in this moment. God, we thank you, Jesus. If you're standing, I just want you to come forward right now. And we're just going to pray for you right now. You come first. If you're here right now and you've never given your life to Jesus, I want you to look up just for a moment. If you're here and you've never crossed that line of faith and given your life to Jesus, Jesus came to bring peace to you. He came to make you whole by the power of his love, by the power of his forgiveness, by the power of his grace, he will set you free. If you're here and you've never given your life to Jesus, but you're ready to do that, I want you to pray this simple prayer with me right now. Just one sentence right now. Just say it to God. Jesus, I give you my life. Right now, wherever you are right now, even if you're walking forward or if you're seated right now, but you're ready to give your life to Jesus, just tell him right now, Jesus, I give you my life. That one sentence will change your life forever. It's not everything you and God need to talk about. There's so much more that needs to be said, but this is where it begins. Right now, just tell him, Jesus, I give you my life. And if you're praying this prayer right now, Jesus, I give you my life. Jesus, I give you my life. Jesus, I give you my life. I want you right now just to hold your hand up high. I want to see you. If you just prayed this prayer, Jesus, I give you my life right now, just hold up your hand. I want to see you in this moment, and I want to pray for you. Jesus, I give you my life. Anyone else? Jesus, I give you my life. Anyone here right now, this is your moment to cross the line of faith. Father, I pray for those who are here this moment who would pray this prayer, Jesus, I give you my life. I pray that in this moment as they cross the line of faith, that God, you would wrap them up in your love, let them know they belong to you, let them know that you love them and you'll never leave them, you'll never abandon them, that this is the beginning of a new journey, of a new life. We thank you, Father. We thank you, Jesus. Would everyone just stand with me right now? Everyone just stand with me. If you're still in your seat, but you know you need prayer tonight, I want you just to feel free right now just to come just to come as the pastors will be here praying for you. And I just would like the pastors just to begin to pray for everyone who's come for prayer right now. Father, we thank you. God, we consecrate this space in Jesus' name. We pray in this moment there would be healing, Father, that there would be deliverance, God, that there would be freedom in this place. 
We pray, Jesus, that, that all the fear would be gone, that, God, all the doubt would just be expelled, that, Father, that the pain, God, would be released, that the healing would begin. God, we pray that you would meet us in our broken places, in our imperfection, in our inadequacy. God, meet us in our failures, meet us in our fears, meet us in this moment, Jesus, and take us forward. We know the journey is too much for us, but it is not too much for you. The journey is not too much for you. So we put our lives in your hands. We put the weight of our lives in your hands. We allow you to carry the weight of all the pressure the weight of our future, the weight of our dreams, the weight, God, of our inadequacies. God, we put all the weight of our lives on you right now, Jesus, for you are the one who can carry us into our future. We thank you, Father, and we pray in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Let's continue praying throughout the auditorium. Hallelujah. Why don't we just lift up our hands, just worship God right now, wherever you are. Listen, if you need prayer, just come to the front for prayer. The rest of us just lift up our hands, just worship Jesus right now. Show up our heart today. Let's worship God with a song. In fear, I try to hide. But with you, I walk into light. In doubt, I try to
Hallelujah. Oh, tonight the Spirit of the Lord is here in this place. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Tonight there is liberty right here in this place. Come on, let's give Jesus a big hand. There is liberty here in this place. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. And sometimes liberty got to be fought. Liberty comes with a price. We got to fight for it. We got to fight for peace. Got to fight for liberty. And the best thing is that we don't fight with our own strength. We don't fight with our own power. But Jesus tonight is coming into our being, coming into our lives to fight for us, to give us that liberty, to give us that freedom. If you believe that, give Jesus a big hand tonight. Hallelujah. Oh, praise you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. So, Father, we want to thank you tonight for such a wonderful, powerful presence here in this place. What a wonderful word of the Lord that set us free. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And Lord, we, we thank you tonight. The word of God has brought us to a place of freedom, a place of peace in Christ. So Lord, we just want to thank you for the work that you have done in us tonight. We love you, Lord. Just another just, just two minutes, just one minute, just lift up your hand. Just receive the peace of God. Hallelujah. Just receive the peace of the Lord. Hallelujah. The grace for the victorious life. The peace that crushed Satan right under our feet. Tonight we receive the peace. We thank you, Lord. That Jesus, you are the Prince of Peace. That fought for us. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name. And all of God's people say, if you love Jesus, give Jesus a big hand tonight.